Porter is up and running. All right. So what do you think of that homework assignment, the program that we had two weeks? My, hmm? I enjoyed it once I got my compiler. <laughs> I think we can do an on, on, online GDD. I mean, you know, this is not one of those programs where you have so so much code that you need multiple files. Uh, online GDD online GDD works really well for for monolithic programs, which means you know, you can contain the source code all into one single file. It doesn't work so well when you have your know, project where you know, you have various you know, source files and you have to link and stuff like that. <clears throat> all right, so. Um, Okay, so I can share my solution. I'm not sure whether it is productive to do so, um, but I can certainly do that. Let me find it first. Uh, CIFD 440. Did you ever get that um, inefficient way to do it? Did you ever try that? <laughs> no. <laughs> I think the most inefficient way to do it is to randomly generate the tickets and then, you know, and then just kind of use a filter. So this way, you know, the completion of the program is you know, probabilistic. And you also have to track what you have printed already, because remember the uh, assignment says you know, no duplication of your know, tickets. So you, know, so you have to remember what you have printed so far, and then just keep randomly generating a new ticket. So if there's a new ticket that you have not generated before, then you feed it through the filter to see whether it should be printed or not. You know, that, that would probably be one of the, the worst algorithm to do in this case. <clears throat> you got excess your processing cycle, I can use it all. <laughs> all right. Sorry? I was going to do that. I was going to find that program. I'm glad I did, but I probably scrapped that project. Yep, that would. It's interesting, you know, from the perspective of, you know, what is the worst way of doing something? Sometimes you know, that is ed educational, um, but other times it's like, mm, you may not want to spend your time that way. Uh, okay, this is 440. All right, so my program is log.c. It's a straight up you know, C program. It doesn't have C++ in it. So the main thing is gen combin. Okay, gen combin is the key to the whole thing and I do it recursively. So when you do something recursively, you have to think about, okay, let me first explain the parameters. I might as well just kind of <clears throat> comment my program along with you know, right now. Um, because when I don't comment my program, guess what? Two days later, I cannot make any sense out of my own program. So that's why commenting is really important, okay? Especially on something like this. There are certain kind of programs where the code itself is truly self-documenting, like. You read the code, you know exactly what is going on. This is not one of those. All right, so I'm going to explain the whole thing. So choices is a parameter. It is an array of, okay, I cannot even remember that part. Um, so I have to look at you know, how the choices are used. So I can look at the n here. So n is the number of remaining files. Okay, so the number of remaining items that I have to choose. So I think choices is where I need to choose from. Okay, so let me go back and say if this is um, points to a null terminated <clears throat> um, array of remaining choices. Okay, so n is just a counter, it counts them down. So when n becomes zero, that means I have no further items to pick out of something, okay? So that's n, uh, and then fill is the next location in an array that stores a ticket to be printed. In other words, you know, with every single recursive call, I am constructing the ticket that I want to print. Okay, so fill, is basically a pointer to the next position of the ticket. It's like, okay, whatever number that I'm choosing, this is where it's supposed to go, okay? Um, and then we have fill start, okay? Fill start is the starting point 
of the array that stores a ticket to be printed. Because as a recursive subroutine, um, by the time I get to the end of the recursion, by the time I go like, okay, this is the entire ticket, uh, where does it start, right? So it can be back computed if you know the number of num you know, the number of items in a ticket. So you can always do a subtraction, you know, with pointers. But it's much better to do it this way because this way, you know, I can change and say, oh, I can handle you know lot of tickets that only have four numbers and then the Powerball number. I can you know I can change I it, I can be a, a lot more flexible this way. I could put it that way. Um and. There is also the last parameter, which is param. It is a void pointer to a constructor for the callback function. And then the last one is the callback function itself, which is cb, callback function, when we are done with all trials. All right, so now I have just you know, Redocumented my entire you know, program here, and I wrote it on the first day when the assignment was you know, assigned. So it has been two weeks. So let's see how much I can remember what I did on day one, that was two weeks ago. All right. So as a recursive subroutine, now personally, I think you know, recursive subroutines are actually easier to write than loops, because the way it has to do with how you look at the problem or how you look at how to solve a problem. So in this case, if n is zero, which means, oh, we are done with all the trials. But heck, there's still more choices. I don't care because I have chosen the ones that I have that I need to choose already. Okay, so n being zero is very significant because it means you know, it is the end of recursion. We are done with choosing everything that we need to choose. So in that case, you know, I specify the return value to be a one, the you know, result is one. I don't even think that is useful at all. And if I have a callback function, so this may be a foreign thing, you know, depending on you know whether you have encountered this concept before. <clears throat> but it really is not uh, a super difficult concept to begin with. So if you look at how CB is declared as a parameter, you can see that it is inside parentheses. And then following the parentheses, you have another open paren and then what it lo what looks like a list of parameters. So CB is what we call a pointer to a function, and the function that it points to should be expecting param as a void pointer, it should be expecting fill as a pointer to an unsigned, and it should be expecting fill start as a um, pointer to an unsigned as well. Okay, so if CB is not null, because you know, I can choose and say, oh, there's no callback function, you know, this is all, you know, there's nothing to do you know, when the recursion ends, then it's not going to do anything. If CB is non-null, that means I have to call the CB function. So this, the syntax of this is a little bit awkward because CB is really a pointer, but I think <clears throat> you are supposed to be doing this you know, because you're dereferencing a pointer, so now you have a function and then you call the function. But I believe you know, the syntax-wise, you know, this is doing the, exactly the same thing just because it kind of makes sense too. So CB is a function that is passed to this particular subroutine. Now, since you're also taking 430, so it means that you already should have exposure to uh, virtual methods. That's basically the old fashioned way to do virtual methods. It's like, well, what we do with this particular method kind of depends on what object we're dealing with. Okay, because at that point, it's not dependent, dependent on the class hierarchy, it depends on the actual object. So do you, do you guys still remember what is a virtual, met virtual method in object-oriented programming? It has to do with abstract classes. So when you derive a subclass of a abstract class, you can have a abstract um, method in the abstract class you know, declaration, which means the abstract class doesn't know what to do. Okay, this is just a placeholder. Okay, a subclass would need to figure it out, figure it out, and define the actual member the method. So when you actually instantiate <clears throat> from the superclass you know, a particular object, that method is stuck with the object itself, as opposed to stuck with the class of the object. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah. This is how we use you know, used to do your virtual functions 
you know, in a certain context, you know, is to pass a function as a pointer into a subroutine. <clears throat> and by the way, if you think this is really kind of awkward programming, you know, real people do not program like this, well, I got news for you too. Because all modern programming languages like Python, Node, which is JavaScript, and so on, they all support this feature to a much better, you know, uh, standard. And it is used a lot in actual real life programming. So, um, so expect that to be around <clears throat> when you get out to work and go like, okay, so now we're actually writing real programs. And you go like, are we passing a function as a parameter into another function? Yes. And you'll be doing it quite a lot too. Yep. You're talking specifically about the callbacks as a, uh, as a concept? Yeah, as a concept. That Yep. <clears throat> um, there are a few reasons why callbacks are super important. I'm digressing a little bit from the main discussion here. Um, it is especially useful in what we call asynchronous programming, which is used a lot because you know now we have a lot of APIs, right? You know, you have OpenAI API, which means you can write a script to ask OpenAI to do something, give you the result, and then you do something with that result before you present the content. To your own, you know, so, uh, to your own request. Somebody asks you about something, you go like, "Okay, I'm gonna go ask OpenAI to get an answer." OpenAI replies to you as a server application, and then you, in return, reply with an HTML document to whatever client that was asking you in the first place. So that seems pretty easy, right? Very sequential. <clears throat> but when you're writing a server script, you don't want to say, "I'm gonna write this script so I can handle only one request at a time." Until this request is fully surfaced, I am not accepting any new you know, new you know, uh, request. That will work, because you know, at a heavier time, at a heavy traffic time, you can be hit by thousands, if not more, requests per second. So if you only handle one request at a time and go like, okay, everybody else, hold your horses. Let me finish this one before I you know, process the next one. <clears throat> you're not going to be able to handle you know, all those requests because a lot of times you know what you're doing is waiting for someone else so if the other request does not need to wait for that someone else they can be handled right away I mean while you are waiting for open AI to come back with an answer you can answer some other questions that do not need to go offline you know, to go to another you know server for an answer so in that case, you know, uh, the callback is useful because you can basically say, okay, I know this is gonna take a while, so I'm gonna, as you're doing this, I'll do something else. All right, tech, uh, so when I do get the reply back from OpenAI, what am I gonna do? Call this function. That is one really important application of callbacks. Now there are abstraction levels, you know, that can make things seem, you know, look a lot simpler, okay? Particularly in uh, JavaScript, there's the concept of await and also async. Okay, now those are fairly advanced concepts, you know, at this level, but they can make things look a lot simpler. But underneath the whole thing, it is based on callbacks. So you still really need to understand callbacks, you know, and in order to use what I would call eye candy. So await and async are basically eye candy for something that is uh, very low level that is done by callbacks. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so the question is, what if n is not zero? So if n is not zero, I distinguish, you know, I differentiate, be, differentiate between two cases. So now, you know, okay, so let me say, okay, n does not equal to zero. But when n does not equal to zero, what does it mean? It, can it go negative? Can n be negative? Look at the type of n. Cannot be negative. So that means if it's not zero, it is positive, which means I'm supposed to have to choose some more items out of the choices. But since choices is now pointing to a null terminator, I don't have any choices anymore. In other words, I am told to say, okay, tech, take two more items out of the bag. But the bag is empty. So what the only thing I can do is like, to go like, um, I cannot finish my mission. So result gets zero, which is a code you know, call, uh, which is a code to return to the caller to basically say, I'm sorry, but I cannot get my job done. All right? <clears throat> so when we get to here, 
this particular else here, it means you know, n is greater than zero, which means it's at least one. And also at the same time, we also know that your know, choices is not pointing to a null, which means, okay, we have at least one item in the bag, and I'm told to get at least one item in the bag. I can do that. Yep, please show us the comments. I can send this code to you guys. I mean, you know, I'm not likely to give the same homework assignment next time. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't the faintest idea what we'll do next semester or what I'm going to do next semester, but it's not going to be this. Okay, all right. So anyway, we get to the last one, which is the one case where oh, we got stuff to do. So in this one, we have a loop. And basically, the loop is saying, you know, when I have when I have alternatives, okay, that's basically what the while is talking about. So as long as choices, whatever choices is pointing to, is not null, I go like, okay, let's take that thing for the one position that I'm supposed to cho to choose, and then do the rest recursively. So what I do first is to say, okay, you know. Whatever choices is pointing to, choose, okay, choose whatever choices is pointing to as my pick in the ticket, okay? So I'm using whatever field is pointing to to store whatever choices is pointing to. So I'm basically locking down one of the numbers on the ticket and say, okay, I'm going to pick this number as my choice for that position in the ticket. Is that okay? Okay. It might take some time to kind of really fully understand this uh, because it took me a while to kind of structure the program to do this. So in that case, this is the magical moment. This is basically the recursive call. So the recursive call is basically saying, all right, so I have done my job. I was asked to choose at least one item. The bag has at least one item. I pick one of those things and put it into you know the combination already. So now I go like, uh, are we all done? I don't care. I'm just going to call someone else to figure, it, figure that out. So when I do the recursive call, this is the key, OK? The choices parameter of the recursive call is my choices plus one, because I have just used it. Is that OK? I have just used this particular number that choices is pointing to. So the recursive call has to start with whatever is after that. Okay? So this is how I handle the problem of not having your know, tickets of the same numbers because once I have chosen something, nobody can choose that ever again because I'm only in even in terms of this order. Okay? N is decremented by one. Okay? I shouldn't say that. I should say, the parameter n of the recursive call is whatever I have as parameter n minus 1. Because if I was told to choose three things out of the bag, I could just pick mine, right? So I'm recursively calling the next invocation and go like, OK, you have to choose two things instead of three, because I have chosen one already. Is that OK? All right? Fill is plus 1, because I have already you know, chosen in the previous you know, statement here, I have already made a choice for whatever position of the combination that I'm supposed to handle. So the recursive call is going to have to start with whatever is next to that location. Does that make any sense? Yep. So this would be like <coughs> when you have an array and then you use square brackets to get what's inside of the array. Mm -hmm. This would be like moving up one position. Yes. Yeah. This is a this is a prime example of the abuse of your pointers versus arrays in C and C++. Because I'm making use of the fact that a pointer and array are really the same thing in C. Okay, it's just whatever, what do you use as an operator? Are you dereferencing it? Okay, then you go like, oh, it's a pointer. If you use the square bracket notation, you're using it as an array. Because in a, po a pointer versus an array, really are exactly the same thing in C and C++, which is great because it can, I can do some stuff like this, but it can also lead to a whole lot of problems 
the type of that. Uh, field start does not change, okay, because it's where the entire ticket starts in memory space does not change, okay. I still need to maintain, I need to maintain this because you know by the time I need to print out the entire thing, I need to know where to start, okay. So that's why I have to keep calling this as a parameter as I perform the recursive call. And I know somebody's going to think, okay, maybe not say out loud. Somebody may be thinking, but can't you just do this with a global variable? Then you don't have to pass it around. Well, okay, what is the problem with global variables? The problem with a global variable is it is difficult to track who can be making changes to those things. So if it is not on the list of parameters and it is actually hidden in the code, then you can have situations where you have you know, a bunch of subroutines, they all access the same global variable, then it's really hard to track down who made the last change that broke the program. Does it make sense? Now, does that mean that you know, when you do not use global variables that you would not have bugs that would break the program? No, that's not what I'm saying. But at least in the case of a subroutine not accessing global variables breaking a program, when it does break the program, if you look at the parameters, you know all the suspects already because all the suspects are on the parameter list. But when you use global variables, who knows? It can be the side effect of any one of these particular functions that is making the last change that broke the program. So it changes the scope of what you need to look into in order to debug the program. Now, in a program like this, obviously, you know, this is probably it's probably okay to use a global variable, but since I really do not like global variables, I just say, okay, we'll just pass it along. All right, so we are passing param, okay, because param is only used by CD. So until we get to the end of the recursion, param is not being used. Uh, CD is the same thing because these two are only utilized when we have reached the end of the recursion, at which point we go like, okay, I'm done with this recursive, these recursive calls. What am I supposed to do at this point? Is that okay? And that's basically the layout of the entire program. And you can see that, you know, I cannot even remember, I, you know, why I put you know, empty <coughs> conditional statements here, because I really did not need to. But what is also important is after the recursive call, I auto increment choices, which basically means, okay, I'm done with using this as my choice, so let's move up the choices so I can move up to the next available choice to me. Are we doing okay so far? So choices is a pointer, point in the, to an array, and the array is representing what choices do I have for a particular thing. So those can be the matching numbers, in which case I would have five things in the array, followed by the null terminator. It can also be the non-matching numbers, in which case it will be the upper bound minus five items in that array before I hit the null terminator. Are we still doing okay so far? Because there are two times that we need to use combination. I need to choose the, not the matching numbers. I also need to choose the non-matching numbers. So there are two occasions where I need to choose something out of you know, a certain number of items. And I'm basically combining those, both of those into the same mechanism. So, sorry? The if and else statement is not needed? It's not needed. Okay. Yeah. It's actually not needed. Okay. Um, well, since gen comes in returns a value of zero or one, or zero or not zero, so I just thought, maybe I need to make use of the return value, and it turned out that I did not. <laughs> so, I, when I write programs, I leave behind things like this, so structurally speaking, I'll be ready to specify. So what do I do if the recursive call, you know, is coming up with a non-zero, which means, oh yeah, I completed my task. Turns out I don't have anything special to do. And what if I did not complete my task? I also do not have anything special to do. Technically speaking, in this case, I could have used a break here 
to break out of the loop because there's no way that you know the future cost you know of gen coming in after incrementing prices would have met the criteria because what this means if I get to the else statement here it means the recursive call had run out of choices it ran into a situation where n is at least one but choices is pointing to a zero already so by moving you know choices you know, forward it's not going to solve the problem so that means you know if I want to optimize the program I could have either put a break here or I could set a condition so that the loop would exit you know because of that condition but you know but the other mechanism would take care of this problem too, so I don't I don't really need to add anything here. All right, so that's the basic mechanism to do to find uh, combinations out of you know, a number of choices. So the next question is, how did I set up um, the main program? So let me let's take a look at the main program first. Since I'm using C and not C plus plus, this is the same thing as using C in to read into Win UB which is a uh, winning number upper bound, okay? Um, and then this is PDUB, which is power ball upper bound. So those are the two first two numbers. And then I have the five um, numbers in the winning ticket, right? So I just call those your know, lucky numbers or put it into the lucky number array. <clears throat> and then we have to read in what is the power ball number and how many of the winning numbers do I need to print the ticket and whether the Powerball number is supposed to match or not. So I'm reading all of those into local variables. All of these are local variables. You can see the declaration from line 83 to line 86. All right, and then what we do here, okay, in this loop here, so what this loop is doing is out of all the values, of, out of all the numbers, um, you know, all the way up to the the upper bound of the winning numbers, I just have to decide, okay, you are a lucky number, you know, you can go to this array, you are not a winning number, you go to that array. So I'm basically just you know, looking at all the potential numbers for the five numbers and throw five of those into one array, which would be the array of um, the winning numbers, and then the other, you know, basically upper bound minus five would go to the other array. So those become my choices. I have one array as choices for the five winning numbers. I have another array as my choices for the non-winning numbers. Is that okay so far? So that's basically how the loop is set up. And the reason why this is a double loop here, and also the reason why I do not directly read the lucky array into the choices is because when I read the winning ticket, there's no requirement that those five numbers need to be sorted. So I do it this way so that you know, you know, those five numbers can be in any order. I mean, just so that the output would stay consistent. Okay, so I want the output to be consistent where it's always listing the winning numbers and then followed by the non-winning numbers and then the two groups are sorted within themselves because that makes it easier for me to look for problems. All right, so now we have structure. <laughs> So we have this structure, uh, unlucky choice, okay? So this structure is basically what is being passed. So when you look at the parameter, this is what we are passing as a null pointer or void pointer to so that the callback can get it. So yes, so I, I'm not expecting you guys to kind of, you know, just using my description to fully really understand how this program works. I would, I would describe it in a slightly different way. It's kind of like you know the the federal use that we just saw. You know, Jan comes in. It's like a rocket engine. Okay, it's a, it's a rocket engine. It has some parameters, but the overall spaceship has two stages of rocket engine. The first stage will get you all the matching winning numbers, and then when that rocket is burned up, okay, you have chosen all the matching winning numbers. The second stage will give you all the non-matching numbers. And then when that rocket burns out, then we get to the part where it will use the Powerball number, and then at that point we can print all the tickets. So the key is get unlucky or gen unlucky is a 
It's a very simple subroutine, okay? The first thing it does is to take a look at params and just you know, cast it into a pointer that is pointing to a struct choice so I can get to the individual components inside the structure. So I use the choices member as the choices. I use the end member as the end parameter. Continue to use the same fill. Continue to use the same you know, fill start. And then whatever param has, because you know, remember, that may not be the last thing I want to do, so that is passed here. And then whatever gen pb is, uh, that is actually a known function because you know, that's generate power ball. So that would be gen pb right here. So gen pb, by the time we get to gen pb, that means we have, we are done with the five numbers already. The only thing we have to handle would be the power ball number. So at that point, I just have to figure out, um, are we supposed to match the power ball numbers? What is the actual winning Powerball number? And then use that to inform, should I print something or not? So the whole program is uh, 160, 26 lines, you know, but it has a lot of stuff that may not need space, like the, the conditional statement that turns out to be empty or there's no, there's no distinction whether you know, the then versus the else statement because they are both empty. So you know, 126 lines is the length of this program. Yep. Uh, we were supposed to get input from C and then the, yes. the output to the output. Yep. Okay, just wanted to double check because I wrote it up and then I was like, I don't know where he wants me to stop, stop it, so I just uh -huh. rearranged it so that way it was C and yep. the C out. Yep, it's C and the C out. So now it's time to test this code, right? You know, I can claim all day long and you know, try to convince you guys that this program does what it's supposed to. But you know, it's time to kind of demonstrate it. So let's go ahead and do that. So I just, oh, I made some changes because of commenting. So we do want to save those changes. Okay, so to do that, we have to exit cell flip. I'm gonna do directory from model.c. It puts it into the buffer so I can paste it into, um, Oh, I thought I, okay, I didn't actually go there. Okay, so, no, online GDB, there we go. All right, so now we're back to online GDB, and I think I have signed in already. Okay, that's good. So that means I can go ahead and paste my program. Okay, control A. Nope, let's do that. Hmm. It did not paste from the buffer. Okay, let me do that one more time. Okay. Control V. No. Okay, is there another way for me to do this? Okay, we can do this. Mouse pad. Model.c. <clears throat> control A, Control C. Let me switch back to my browser. Just pass it. There we go. Paste. Nope, it's not letting me paste. That is. There we go. So Control V for whatever for what for whatever reason it's intercepted somewhere. It just didn't get to it. Okay. Um, and now we have to specify a standard in when it is running. I believe that's just me typing stuff in. So we run. Oh, forgot to choose the language first. Just regular C. All right, so the program is now running. I just have to give it the input. I believe it's 10 for the upper bound, 10 for the upper bound. And then the ticket is one, two, five, what, seven, eight. Okay. And then the Powerball number was a six. I want three to match and not to match the Powerball number. Press the Enter key. Now, this is harder for me to kind of capture the output. You know, there has to be a way to do it, but I'm not really sure how to do it. But I'm pretty sure the output is correct. So if I were to count the number of tickets printed out, it should be 900 exactly. Yep. So when you say out, do you mean it will go to the So when I test your program, I haven't really quite decided yet. <laughs> 
how to do it. He's gonna do it all by hand. <laughs> One thing you know for sure is that I'm not gonna do it by hand. <laughs> um, I'm likely to record the standard output of your program and then feed it into the input of a JavaScript program because JavaScript is nice because it has the set notation, so I can just rely on this built-in type to handle the you know, set you know, handling. Um, and then I have to keep track of you know, what elements I'm supposed to see or what you know, tickets I'm supposed to see and make sure that everything that is supposed to be there are there and everything that is not supposed to be there are not there. Yep. Um, so in my case, I wound up doing everything in, numeric in numerical order. Uh -huh. so, uh, that works. Okay, just make sure. Yeah, the ordering within the tickets would not matter okay. because I did not specify anything. And then the ordering within the set notation also would not matter because I did not specify whether that should be ordered or not. And they really should not matter because it's inside a set, right? Um, but it is important to use comma separation to use the curly braces and also a comma to separate it from the power ball number. So as long as that part is okay, you know, I think you know, I would write my script to handle you know, the output correctly. Okay. Yep. yep. All right. Yep. Go ahead. Um, I just have the tools already done. You know, um, <laughs> I I have extended the set notation in JavaScript to handle you know a set of sets or a set of tuples or tuple of sets and so on and so forth. So that means your grading this would be a whole lot easier because each one of these is going to be a tuple and I just have a set of two tuples, a gigantic one at that, and then I, when I read one ticket, I just have to say, cross it out, cross it out. Is it supposed to be in the set? Yes. And cross it out, cross it out. So when I find something that is not in the set of all the tickets, I go like, okay, this is not supposed to be there. Or if I, you know, if there are still remaining items in the set of all the possible tickets, you know, at the end of your output, that means you have missed some some items, you know, and not generated. So I think I'm gonna, yeah, I will work it out that way. Yeah, I would just bend whenever, because I would test it with, uh, uh, to make sure like that the Powerball was. Mm -hmm. I, I did like the same sort of thing, except for the Powerball was uh, wanted. Mm -hmm. um, just so that way it would be like less like output. Yep. And I was really concerned whenever it hit a hundred exact, and I was like, uh, I hope I didn't do something wrong. <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to you know, show you guys you know, you know, how to really debug your program. You know how to use a minimum you know, test case to test your program. So in this case, I'm specifying you know, six as the upper bound of the five field numbers. I'm using one as the upper bound of the Powerball number which means I don't have a choice, okay? The only thing that makes sense is to match the Powerball number. But I can still specify to have four out of the five numbers to match the actual winning ticket, but I do have to specify a one here to mean that, you know, I have to match the Powerball number, and that should be five tickets in this case, okay? Why do I have five tickets? Because out of the five you know, winning numbers, I'm going to miss one of them for each of the tickets, so the first ticket is going to miss the one, and instead it will have a six in place of the one. The second one is going to miss two, and in place of the two, it will have a six, and so on. So that should be five tickets that it will print out. So let's see. So that's exactly the five tickets, and you can see six are in every single one of those, because six is not a winning number, and I specifically only ask for four winning numbers. So the extra one not being the non-winning number is correct. And then out of the five winning numbers, I'm missing the five, I'm missing the four, I'm missing the three, I'm missing the two, I'm missing the one. So, and then the Powerball number are supposed to be matching, and they, they are matching indeed. So the key is to use smaller test cases, okay? Um, I gave you the example of 900 output. That's moderate, okay? But I was expecting people to go like, even that is too much for me to check you know, manually, so I would reduce the upper bound to the point where I can actually just visually look at something and be able to see whether it's output or not, whether, whether the output is correct or not. Yep? So the way how I did my code, I didn't actually rely on like parsing and like looking at how many times you do it or like the key and the mm -hmm. um, The only time I did it, I just did the same thing, but now I'm just importing. Mm -hmm. 
I see. If you want to take a look at mine, um, I did mine in a way where it, or if you want to meet up with me after class, um, I did mine in a way where uh, mm -hmm. basically, can I come up there and write on the whiteboard really quickly? Sure, go ahead. You can do the whiteboard or do you want to do it on the tablet? Um, I can do it there? on the whiteboard probably. Okay, so well, because the whiteboard is not captured in these recordings. So basically, the way that I had done mine was uh, I figured that so you have why I focused on was just like the uh, problem on the five item ticket itself, and so whenever I would go through, I would check to make sure that as I was generating numbers, um, it went from. Uh, the sum of all the ones like that are correct, or the sum of like the ones like up to the number that I had uh, within it. Uh, I did it, sorry, I did it with a weird kind of array sort of thing, where uh, as I was generating numbers, I was also generating whether or not it was in the winning ticket. And then I'd go through the sum of those and make sure that that was less than or equal to the uh, item counter that we had, so the number of items like that we wanted uh, correct, or that it was large, or that, yeah, that it was less than or equal to item counter, uh, or it was greater, and it was greater than or equal to item counter minus, uh, and then this was a variable between four all the way down to one, um, depending as to where we were in the for loop. Um, and then like I said, if you want to pull up my code that I wrote for mine, um, okay. you can. <clears throat> well, we can do that. Just because. I like the way that I did mine, and yeah. There's a reason why you know uh, you guys are given two weeks to work on this one. Now, the other way to do this, you know, the other extreme way to do this, is to um, use a nested loop that are five level deep, and then yeah. plus an extra loop you know, that would go through the Powerball numbers. So let me get to be greater. This is how I can retrieve your code. No worries. Uh, your last name is Nick M. Yep. 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 So you can uh, you can go through the code like this, or I can just download it and you you can go over um, I mean, whichever way you scroll. Either better. way. Um. But if you scroll down a little bit more. Uh huh. Um. And then yeah. So if you take a look down. Here at the summary, um, yeah. So the summary of ticket up to the counter of four is mm -hmm. less than or equal to item counter, and it's within the bound. So it has an upper bound of item counter, and then the lower bound of item counter minus whatever uh, nested loop we are in, kind of. Okay. Um, and then that way, the moment that you break out of that, uh, you would no longer have a ticket that would be winning. If that makes sense. So or you're tracking the number of winning tickets as you go through yeah, the winning this whole thing. Numbers. So you can basically exit earlier and say that, okay, there's no way this is going to work anymore. Yeah, so you if can you have like take an early exit. Yeah, if you have like okay. one, two, three, four, five, in a sense, and you have like 10, mm -hmm. uh, and you only want three, and you have one, two, three, four, you know that you won't ever be able to get that last number to match mm -hmm. with only three. So. Yeah, so this is how you define some array. You pass an array <laughs> A in it, and you specify the number, and then you use a loop where the index goes from zero to num. So num is the upper bound of how far you could go into the array. Yeah. And then you basically just, oh, okay, so you're just adding each 
um, array elements, and then you return the sum of those elements. Yeah, because okay. all of those uh, arrays will be either a zero or a one. So. Would you enter? You know, would you encounter a situation where there are multiple ways to sum to get to the same sum, and you know, get confused? You know whether this will work or not because you're using a less than or equal to item counter, and what is item counter? Item counter is one of the things that is given here. Yes, it is uh, the hmm. one that is depending on to how many of them you want uh, okay. matched. So what is ticks? Uh, that is a temp or that is a uh, array of whether oh, or not. Okay. it's like a boolean okay. array. Of so ticks is important match. because ticks is actually telling you whether it is a match or not. Yes. Because you know, you a ticks element can either be a one or a zero. Yes. Okay. And so okay. yeah, that was okay. the array that you had. So but you're basically using an array of booleans to implement a set, basically, yes. and you're counting the cardinality of the set as you go. Yeah. And you basically go like at a certain point, there's no way we can find. You know, a ticket that is printable, so we can either we can just stop here. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. So. Cool. Cool. Yeah, I just figured that that would kind of possibly help with the uh, figuring out as to where it is in the thing. Okay. Yep, it doesn't have to be fancy. Okay, I chose the way that I wanted to do this. You know, just because I wanted to use recursion to do it, I wanted to be to have the you know, code density. So the other way to do this, okay, you know, I can just outline this code. I'm not gonna, you know, run this code here. So let me make a copy of this to uh, lotto one dot c. Okay, so the other way to do this is really just to do it very iteratively. So what I'll do is I'm going to take line 101 all the way down to uh, 144 out, 101 to 124, take them out, oops, okay, 101 to 144, delete. All right, so I have retained the code to read the 10 parameters. So at this point, you know, you can just do the, um, <laughs> you can do it the, uh, the long way. So we can we'll just say your four, um, I, you know, this is the first number, so we can say this is numbers zero, started with uh, one, and you want numbers bracket zero to be less than whatever the upper bound is, so winning number upper bound uh, minus five, because you, know, you have five uh, winning numbers. So you know, to prepare room for the other five, you know, this is you know, the way to do it. But if you don't want to do it this way, that's fine too. It will still work. So then you plus plus numbers zero, okay? All right, so this loop here is basically just making the first element of the ticket to cycle through all the possible values, starting with a one, ending up with your win uh, upper bound, and that goes through all the possible values that the first number can go through. Does that make sense? So now you know, what we do, is we're going to do a bunch of copy and paste, which I really do not recommend, but it's okay. We can. This is how we do the second number, except the second number should not start with one anymore. It should start with one plus whatever the previous number is, because this way we're not we're guaranteed not to reuse the same number, because when the first number is moving up to let's say six already, that means the second number in the ticket that we're constructing has to start with. Seven. Does that make sense? Okay. So now we just do a bunch of your copy and paste. <laughs> so this is a two. This is going to be um, a one. And that's going to be a two. That's going to be a two. I mean, you can even use a macro you know, to do all this stuff here. So now we have a three. This is two. This is going to be a three. This is going to be a three. Okay, I mean this is as brute force as it can possibly be, and not using probability. All right. So now, by the time I'm done with this part here, I already have the five numbers chosen. Okay. So now I just need one more loop. Okay, for the Powerball number, 
So the Powerball number, which is the, the sixth number in the whole sequence, now that one starts with one because it is independent from the five numbers you know, earlier. And it has its own upper bound, which is PBUB, which is the Powerball upper bound. And you know, for every loop, we also just want to increment it like so. So whatever code I put here is basically now I have generated every single possible ticket. So the only thing left for me to do is to do the is to do the filtering, is to basically to see to say okay numbers as an array is a six number array where the first five numbers are the uh, choices of the five numbers which can be winning or not winning and then the sixth number is going to be the powerball number and now I can just check right you know, I can just you know, do the cross checking so this is the other way to do it this is, that's using an R yep. <laughs> And there's nothing wrong with it, okay? You know, because you know, this is what we call the generate and test approach, um, which is a very common technique you know, in AI. You know, okay, when I say AI, I don't mean open AI, the kind of AI, but you know, a lot of algorithms in AI would utilize as a, a strategy like this to generate all the possible all the po all the possible choices, and then you filter through the ones that work and versus the ones that do not work. So this is the sim uh, in terms of you know, starting the coding, this is probably the best, okay? Because you know, it is a, um, by the time you get here, you really just have every single ticket. So now what is left to do is to see, is to say, okay, should I print this ticket or not? Okay, so do you want, you guys want me to kind of finish this, you know, since we are already here? We might as well just spend the whole class here talking about this. Mm -hmm. So basically, it depends on the amount of numbers and the the um, user input that you have. Mm -hmm. So if you want to say, um, so let's say if the num if the numbers you have is three, it looks mm -hmm. like the first three numbers is in the array. So um, so what if I did with I J and K? So it looks like those and select plus one and and um and C. Okay, if you're matching, that's good. But for the rest of the numbers, um. I, J, and K are matching, which is three, J, L, and M. Um, the way how they work is that they are not tied to I, J, and K, but L is now mm -hmm. L equals zero, and then M equals L plus one. Okay. And it um, works in it. Um, Let me see if this is okay. close to what you did, okay? So what I do is I have the outer loop, you know, first initializing match count, which is the counter of the number of matching, you know, numbers. So that has to be initialized to zero. And it's also going to initialize, you know, one of the two indexes to zero because we, we need to start from the beginning. Um, and then the WT index, which is winning ticket index. Okay, so this is referring to the winning, tic winning ticket. So this index always has to be less than five, okay? Because we only want we only want to match the first five in the array because the sixth one is the Powerball number. And by the way, you know it only the lucky number array only has five items, um, so it has to be less than five. And then for each iteration, I increment this by one. And then in the nested loop here, so once again we have nested loops. So this one is um, T index, which is the index to go through the ticket. That I'm that I have just generated. So one index is going through the winning ticket. The other one is going through the ticket that I'm gener that I have just generated. So it has the same lower bound, the same upper bound, and also we increment it every for every single iteration, like so. So by the time we are in this loop here, we are now you know going to match every number from the winning ticket to every number in the ticket that I have just generated. Because there's supposed to be no duplicate, I don't have to cross out items as they have matched. Okay, because otherwise I have, to do, I have to do that so that I don't end up double matching something. But since we are not supposed to have the same number appearing twice in either of the array, we can just, you know, just use a conditional statement. Or better yet, use a ternary expression. So we can say, um, what is the name that I've chosen? Match count. So match count is match count, match 
discount plus a ternary expression. And the ternary expression is really just looking at the array of all the lucky numbers, which are the five numbers from the winning ticket with the WT index controlling which one I'm looking at versus um, the ticket that I just generated, which is numbers and the index is T index. So I have two indexes in this case, one for each one. And if this is true, then go ahead and increase the count by one. Otherwise, do not increase the count, which means adding zero to match count. So when these two loops are concluded, okay, which is here, then I can say, okay, if uh, T, okay, sorry, with if match count is the same as the number of winning tickets, we num the number of winning numbers in a ticket, which is num win, and that's red over here from standard in, then we have something to do. Otherwise, we're, we're done with this iteration, okay? So in here, I have to now handle the Powerball numbers, right? So I have to basically go like, okay, if I'm supposed to match the Powerball number, I look for a match. If I'm not, so, so, if I'm not supposed to match the power number, I need to make sure they do not match. So here we have, um, there are many ways to specify this logic. Um, we can do if PD match, which means we are supposed to match, and, okay, so we can say and here, um, and it is indeed a match. So in numbers, it is the last item that is the Powerball number, and then you know, we have read the actual Powerball number itself into its own variable, which is Powerball, okay? So if that is the case, we print. On the other hand, this is one reason, or, okay, so the other reason is Powerball match is not is false, okay, which means we're not supposed to match. So in that case, I have to confirm that the Powerball number on the ticket that I'm looking at, that I'm that I just generated, is indeed the, not the same as the Powerball number on the winning ticket. So if one of these two conditions is true, I'm good. We we now can print the ticket out. So um, I can make I can write fairly elegant code to make this work, you know, because I can use a loop to go through the first five numbers in numbers as an array, or I can make this really ugly, okay? So let's go make this ugly. Print F, uh, open curly brace, percent U, percent U, percent U, percent U, percent U, close, percent U, line feed, okay. So now we can just, we, have, we just have to specify the first five numbers of the numbers array, Actually, we're printing the entire array here, right? So this is truly ugly code because I could have done this a lot more elegantly, but that's okay. I'm just illustrating alternative ways of doing things. Okay, I'm getting a little, okay, this is supposed to be two, three YY, three, four, five, get rid of this, close paren, I think that should do it. All right. So I'll be very surprised if this works the first time because, you know, I mean, what are the chances, right? So we'll, we'll find out. GCP dash G dash O, Lotto, Lotto. Oh, this is Lotto 1. Lotto 1 dot G. Lotto 1 dot G. There we go. All right. Okay. As expected, there are a few problems. Line 111 is. Missing, yeah, the semicolon is supposed to be here, is a comma, and then line 126, ah, uh, fix one thing at a time. Um, <coughs> law to one dot C, line 111. There we go. Um, and then the other one is line 26, expected semicolon before close curve. Oh, okay, I just forgot these close semicolon or the semicolon on that line. On 126, this is why, you know, the reason why I do this is because I also program in JavaScript, and in JavaScript, the semicolon is optional at the end of a statement. So I'm used to not putting that semicolon at the end of a statement. Okay, that should be it. Woohoo, okay. So let's try this. Uh, run this with um, the test input. I don't have the test input with me, so I'm gonna have to kind of hand enter the whole thing, uh, but I can log the output. So we can log the output to 
lotto1.log. Okay, so now we give it the upper bounds, same. Uh, we give it the same ticket, one, two, five, seven, eight, and then the six. Uh, match, the, match three of the winning numbers. Do not match the Powerball number. Press the Enter key. Looks like I got into an infinite loop, infinite loop of some kind. All right, this is great, okay? Because I have, what, more than 15 minutes to show you guys how to debug a program. And this is actually really important stuff. So the first thing is I'm gonna go into uh, lotto1.log and see if it has anything. Woo, look at this. <laughs> Can you tell me which loop is, has a problem? The Powerball number, it keeps going up. Okay, isn't that the easy one to fix? That should be an easy one to fix. Because I know you're where the, the loop is. So the Powerball number is the last of the loop here and it did not exit correctly because I'm using the wrong number to compare. And you know, so this is supposed to be itself. Okay, so there we go. I think that's the only problem that we can spot so far. Okay, is that okay so far? Did you guys you know, kind of figure out that, okay, it's probably that loop that is having a problem? Okay, excellent. So let's run it again, okay. Uh, 10, 10, or should I put it into a file so I can re just redirect? One, two, five, seven, eight, and then a six, and then a three and a zero. Okay, we still have an infinite loop of some kind because it's not exiting. So control C, it'll stop the whole thing. If I cannot figure this out using the log file, it is still there. Is that because I forgot to recompile? <laughs> Typical of me, gcc dash d dash o lotto one lotto one dot c. Okay, now we can try again. And this time, I'm gonna specify the input, lotto.in, 10, 10, 1, 2, 5, 7, 8, 6, and then a 3 and a 0. There we go. So now we can just run the lotto1, redirect from, what was it again? Lotto.in, and then output is lotto1.out, okay, instead of log. Okay, well, let's take a look at the output. Looks like you got it. Yep. Yep. So I'm curious because we don't go into the work here, but when it, I was confused when you brought in the input as from 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 as the winning ticket. As the winning ticket? Yeah. Okay, we can do that. So we'll, it, we'll do a lotto one dot in. So do you want to keep the upper bound as 10, 10? Yes. Okay, 10, 10. And the winning numbers are 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Wait, that's already five from numbers. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, from 6 to 10. Okay. 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And any, any number. Okay. Um, how many do you want to match? Um, three, and zero. 3 and 0. Okay, all right. So that should give us the same number of lines, but the tickets would look different, right? Okay. Uh, which program do you want me to test first, with my original or the program that I just worked on? Original. Okay, all right. So we'll use the one that we just worked on. Redirect from lotto one dot in, and then redirect to lotto one dot out. Okay, there we go. Look at lotto one dot out. Okay. So it shows you know six, seven, eight as the winning numbers, one and two as the non-winning numbers. That looks good. And if we look at the number of tickets, that looks right too. So the reason why I say that is because now it's looking at my code. And so when you go in and you click down um, and you you know, come to one of the tickets or you come to the upper bound, mm -hmm. it spots an infinite loop. So I was just wondering. Cost an infinite loop. I, I meant to say for bug, but I was mm -hmm. just wondering if you had a solution to that. Okay. Yeah. So this approach would not get into any kind of infinite loop because it's a very um, deterministic algorithm. It will basically generate every single ticket that is possible and then just check whether the generated tech ticket meets the requirement or not. 
So it's a very deterministic approach. It's not a very fast approach though. So I can time it to figure out you know, how much time it takes, right? So I can say time, okay, I can just do this and then put a time in front of it. So this took um, eight seconds of real time and four seconds, 0 0.004 or four milliseconds of user time. And then the other one is, Um, much faster. <laughs> and that's without the optimization of, oh, by the way, you know, there's no need to go any further because we know it's not going to work because I could have included that break statement in the loop so that I don't explore anything further than that. So, so this tells you, you know, right away you can kind of tell that, you know, this takes eight, sec point eight milliseconds of real time. This one only takes one millisecond of real time. So kind of makes a difference. Yep. Zero as the upper bound. Oh, I think I you mean, need I numbers mean, to match. I think, I think that's just the, that's the number. So oh, so it would generate every single one? Okay, in that case, the first algorithm will now use the same amount of time as, okay, I shouldn't say that. The other way around. The first program that I wrote would have used the same amount of time, if not more, because recursion is not efficient. So if you end up generating every single ticket that's possible, then the iterative approach is actually more efficient. But is the constant time kind of more efficient? So it's just a ratio in that case. You're not gaining in terms of complexity, you're gaining in terms of just the coefficient for that particular complexity. But let's go ahead and play with this, okay? So we'll test uh, uh, lotter one dot in. You're basically saying, okay, what if we don't want any match here, right? But the other one is still not gonna go through every single one because you can either match or not match. So this will still generate more, right? Okay, so let's try that. So the original algorithm based on the uh, modified parameter is now taking four seconds, uh, four milliseconds as the real time. And then the one that is uh, iterative based on all loops is taking less time. Which is actually not surprising. This is actually not surprising because this one still ends up basically going through every single ticket but using a recursive mechanism. So now you have to pay for the extra overhead of doing things in a recursive way. But then the other one is iterative which means you know we just have tight loops, you know, you know six levels of nested loops, and then inside there there's also you know two additional levels. So you have at the you know at the extreme end we have eight levels of loops, but uh, loops without um, recursion there's no function call and return. So the amount of access memory access is actually much reduced, and because we are also going through the arrays in a very sequential way, and the arrays are relatively small, so that means everything fit into the cache. So that's why it, it runs extra fast because you have locality of memory access in that case. So if you want to see more extreme, you know, even more extreme cases, you know, we can look at, um, okay, I think this is not gonna be practical. <laughs> but one can try. Yep, 26 for that one. All right, so. I, for this one, I have to keep an eye on my CPU temperature, <laughs> and the recorder maybe may get me stuttered to just because this process will suck up every single you know the processing cycle. Yep. Well, actually, yeah. So when if the video is missing frames, you know everything is going to be in fast motion because people are thinking. Oh, you know, this is sucking up so much time, so the video is going to be slow in slow motion. It's exactly the opposite, because this process is sucking up all the time. If OBS is losing time, you know, because it just there's just not enough time to allocate to OBS, then it will be missing frames. But missing frames means you know when you replay it, it'll be in fast motion. 
Yeah, you can see how because 69 factor factorial is is a little bit or 69 choose five is significantly larger. We it, we have what 300 million compared to the other one. So this is with the more efficient algorithm too. So even that one is struggling with you know how much time it's going to take to finish this. Yeah. The last yep. Yep. So a lot of this time, if I do a control C, you can see a lot of time is spent. Oh, okay, not so, not as much as I thought. I thought it would spend more time on this system stuff, but a lot of it is going into the I/O stuff because it's actually printing and you know sending the file. You know, it's trying to remember those your know, tickets. So I think the I/O time is actually kind of significant in this case too. Yep. The loop one. This is the loop one. Lotto one is the loop one. Lotto is the non is the recursive one. That one's gonna be even slower. Hmm? Huh? What? Well, I I have this external fan here. I just kind of have to kind of put it here. Now, uh, okay, modern CPUs you will not die, you know, even if you tried, because they have a they have a sensor on board, and when the CPU temperature gets to a certain point, it would just simply uh, throttle you know the frequency, so it just kind of clock itself back down again until the temperature is stable. So it's not that easy to kill the CPU. I was just kidding, you know, when I said you know <laughs> it's kind of overheat. How did it take out that sensor? Huh? Oh, to take out that sensor. I don't think you can. I think it's a built-in feature. And that's why, you know, you cannot blow up your processor. You can test the reliability. Huh? You can test the reliability of the sensor. Oh, I have used this computer to transcode, you know, video files and whatnot. So it has gone through a lot of the, you know, tests, you know, for hours, you know, to you know, do transcoding. So I know it's not going to blow up. All right, so what we have we learned in this particular homework assignment as you were doing it? Um, when all else fails, try and try again. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I did not get a chance to write that pretty much down to <laughs> That's okay. It'll come back. <laughs> in funny events, but what is it? Um, anyone else? Did you practice your debugging skills? I make many a T output. Okay. <laughs> Did you reduce the upper bound so that you have more control over how many outputs it's supposed to give you? Because that's one of the most important technique is to reduce the number of cases so that way it, you don't have to go through like 900 items to see whether all, every single one of those is correct or not. So you can just kind of chop it all down. Did you test some of the boundary conditions? In other words, one of the boundary conditions, you know, even using the original one, 10, 10, 1, 2, 5, 7, 8, or 6. Okay, there's one way I can specify the parameter that is yet to come, so it prints only one single ticket, right? Because I want to match all five and also the Powerball number. So in that case, it should print back the original ticket, the original winning ticket, which is 1, 2, 5, 7, 8, or 6. So this is what we call boundary you know, condition because, you know, it is you know, one of the extreme cases of you know, testing the program. So, yep. I can post that, sure. Yep. So what are you going to do with the SMK? Archive it. These are fairly simple stuff, okay? So for those of you who enjoy the, ho the homework assignment, Okay, you don't have to raise your hand so the rest of the class will target you from here on. <laughs> but if you enjoy the process of writing code like this, you might enjoy um, Lead Code. Okay, so go to leadcode.com and they have a lot of interesting problems that makes this one look like, you know, child's play. I'm not kidding you. Okay, this is like not even close to some of the complexity of the other one, but you might enjoy that. Okay, if you enjoy solving this problem, you might enjoy the lead code problem. Yes. So when will you see the um, higher 
Okay, so the Computer Science Club did that last semester. And is Chris here today? No. Not. Okay. Can I yep. ask you a question? Yep. Can you guys like have the competition of being professors? I was just about to say that. Yeah. yeah. Drew, Ryan, and you, have, you can have a corner ranger too. That'd be fun. Hmm. I'm, I'll present that idea to the Computer Science Club. But I still want to maintain a collegial relationship with my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> it will be, so I'm just like, you know, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, I'll, I'll just put it this way. I think some of my colleagues are more competitive than others. Who's who? <laughs> that would be an interesting one, okay? But I would say in that case, you know, people who teach you know, CISP 430 and 400, would have an advantage over people who usually just teach you know, 360 and 300. Because 430 does involve you know, algorithms and data structure, so they are more in tune with what lead code problems really need, you know, which is a certain way of looking at the problem. When people teach 300 and 360, we are basically just looking at the language, um, the syntax, you know, and all the more basic concepts. So I would say people who teach 300, 360, and even 400 would not be, would not have that extra advantage of teaching, you know, like this class or 430. So it would just be me and Iraj. <laughs> and you know how Iraj is, right? You know, he's just doing like, hmm. I'm not sure whether he write code or not. You know, how often does he write code in class like what I just did? No? <laughs> I really enjoy that. I really enjoy writing code, you know, impromptu, you know, that was, nothing was planned, you know. I mean, I cannot really say nothing was planned, okay, because I knew he had pros, you know, from day one. I told you guys about, you know, pros, generate and test. I gave you the blue vector blue thing, you know, just to show you, okay, this is how we can print choose three out of five, right? So that was my idea of giving you the hint of eventually constructing a program like this. Okay. And the generate and test approach does not need recursion. It does not need the callback functions. doesn't need a lot of the other extra things for the uh, recursive uh, program. All right. So as I said, you know, if you enjoy this process, you know, look into lead code um, because you know, that's where you can find some additional problems. I wouldn't do it like before the semester ends, okay? But when you have free time, like you know, over the winter break, or over the summer break or something like that, I would definitely put some time into solving problems on lead code because that is how your employer is going to test your technical capability when you try to interview for a job these days. Okay, because your know, employers have already learned not to trust the GPA you know, from any university. The GPA is just go like, okay, I can see that you pass. But it's a 4.0. You passed, okay. You know, now let me give you our test to really check whether you know your stuff or not. <clears throat> so you are, this generation is getting into that type of employment, you know, where your, your employer would not just look at your, your diploma. It's like, but I got a computer science degree from Berkeley. We are still gonna give you our test. But I got a computer <laughs> science degree from North American College. That will, that will give you the ability to transfer, right? <laughs> I do have to say that I have students who uh, took classes at Sac State and did not have the prerequisite to get into that class. And then the student approached the professor and said, okay, I want to take this class, but I think I have the prerequisite even though it, it's not as one of my classes that I have taken. So the, the Sac State professor asked the student, so who was the professor who you know, taught you this? You know, this kind of stuff. And then you know, the student said, it was Tech Ouyang from uh, ARC. And then the Sac State professor just was like, okay, fine, get in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure whether it's a good thing or not, you know, but that's what the student told me. Another student told me from Davis, like the last year as a senior at UC Davis, uh, he wrote me an email and go like, well, <clears throat> your class is the only class I got to be at ARC but I'm still using the material that you taught me as a senior at UC Davis. Once again, not sure whether that's a good thing or not, okay, but you know, it's just your know, fact. 
Hmm? Correlation? Nah, it's just fact. You know, you can interpret any way you want. <laughs> Maybe I just teach my students to cheat better. Maybe that's why they are you know, handling all their classes. Alrighty, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. So get ready for the test, okay? And it's time to stop the recorders.